Good evening. Welcome to our midweek Bible study at Bible Baptist Church. We invite you to stand and join us as we begin the service tonight with a couple of our hymns. There is power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the prayer. tonight the power in the blood take a moment welcome those around you let them know you're glad to see them tonight before our next song about the blood what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood something really crazy in a Baptist church. I mean, really crazy. We're going to go all out here. We're going to sing the third verse instead of skipping over it. Call me wild, call me crazy, but we're going to sing the third verse. Whoo! A little nervous about this, Dudley. Here we go. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Nothing but the blood. 
Jesus and on the last. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood. Yeah, that's right. We sang the whole song, the whole song. Welcome tonight. We're glad you're here. Folks still coming in, and, and uh, we've got everyone scattered. It's uh, uh, Wednesday night, of course, is usually our smallest uh, attendance of the week, but we have people everywhere, children's building, youth building, choir uh, area, and then, of course, here. So there's a lot going on, college and career. There's a lot happening on campus, and so everybody's kind of scattered tonight, but we are thankful that you've come. And... Uh, Look forward to tonight's Bible study. I'm going to ask Brother Larry Howell if he would begin with prayer, please. Amen. Thank you so very much. You may be seated. And in just a few moments, we're going to be starting our lesson on the church at Sardis, and that's in Revelation 3. So if you want to turn there, and if you've not received one of the handouts, I think there are some more in the back. Uh, anyone need one of those handouts while we're uh, getting ready? Okay, I think we've done a good job of covering everyone. Um, but before we do that, let me just remind you of a couple things that are happening this week. Saturday is men's prayer meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning here in Missions Hall behind us. If you've noticed, we've started uh, transitioning that name from Victory Hall to Missions Hall. And if you've been down that hallway, you know what we're talking about. That's where we're featuring all of our missionary updates and letters. And uh, we're going to be sharing more about that in Missions Month next month. But you can go down that hallway. And uh, we used to have the letters maybe uh, 10 to 12, maybe 20 sometimes letters in one kind of a bulletin board, which made it difficult for everybody. If you more than two or three people were there wanting to read letters, uh, you couldn't all see it at the same time and didn't have time in between uh, services. But now we have all 50 of our missionaries spread out by continent. Uh, down the hallways. And so if you have a particular missionary that you're interested in hearing about, one of our Mexico missionaries or one of our South American or Asian missionaries, you can go to that area, find their most recent letter that we have, and be updated with that. And so we'll try to... It's also a visual. Um, uh, it's one thing to say pray for our missionaries, but when you walk up and down those halls and you see uh, those countries and you see those names and you see those letters, it's a reminder uh, that those folks are representing us all around the world. And so I'm very pleased with the Missions Hall and how it's turned out and hope that it'll be a good uh, uh, addition uh, to our missions emphasis here in months and uh, weeks ahead. Uh, this Sunday is the uh, last Grill Night Fellowship of the Summer. And uh, I know Brother Dwight was asked if we could push it back a few weeks because all his family's coming in and he said, that's a cheap dinner. Amen? It brings all his grandkids to, uh, to church and, and uh, feeds them well. But uh, no, it's going to be this Sunday night, so bring your family and grandkids, all right, <laughs> and we'll feed them. Uh, this Sunday evening, uh, bring a snack or a side dish or dessert, anything you'd like to share. And uh, it's just been good fellowship all summer long, amen? I've really enjoyed that. It's a time to keep the church family together and uh, bonded together as we go through the summer months. And folks now are back getting into uh, the normal routines of school and church and work and vacation times and things are, are winding down. So that's this Sunday evening uh, at uh, 6.15, right after the evening service. There is a uh, back to school bash coming for our teenagers. That's a big event. Brother Schuyler's trying to reach a lot of unchurched kids and get our students to invite uh, their friends from school. Uh, we, we put it back a couple weeks after school started to give them a chance to really be around the kids at school, invite them, and get them to come to that. Uh, that's on Sunday, August 21st. Our men's golf scramble, it's not too late to sign up. We still have some openings. You can sign as an individual uh, or as a, as a team. Uh, and so see Brother Larry Howell if you have any questions or stop at the 
welcome center there and uh, he can get you squared away. We do have new CLU classes coming and I apologize for the delay in announcing the, the list. Uh, Brother Paul is our director of education. He's been on vacation again, right? I never know one man to have so many vacations in my life, except Brother Tommy. I think Brother Tommy ranks first and then Paul's maybe second. Anyhow, uh, we were finalizing. He was waiting on some word back from some of the teachers and so and some of the curriculum. So we will be having that in the bulletin in the next, uh, I think it's on August 21st. We'll have the sign-ups beginning. And it's not the first Wednesday of September. It's the 14th of September. Um, so we have plenty of time to get information. And so when that happens, we'll move everybody back to Missions Hall, okay? So those individual Bible studies will be held in Missions Hall, and there will be three or four uh, for you to choose from that you'd like to attend during those Wednesday night services, okay? A uh, lot more in the bulletin. There may be some flyers left about our revival coming up with Pastor Ryan Bevan, and you can get those at, uh, at the Welcome Center and take as many as you like. They're set up as a postcard. Um, you, you are more than welcome to put an address on it and a stamp and mail it to somebody, but you can also hand it out uh, to family and friends that way. It's just a nice uh, first-class, very full-color uh, brochure that you can hand out, an invitation card, rather, that you can give them. So I'm looking forward to that, and we've been talking. We started Sunday, a little bit of emphasis on, on, on the revival and getting our hearts ready to make an impact on lost people and uh, continue to reach out to visitors. Um, I was seeing the July reports as we're getting ready for our deacons meeting this week, and I'm just at awe of how uh, the Lord keeps sending visitors and guests and new families and and uh, I, I wish that, you know, COVID was all behind us and we were growing by leaps and bounds, but we're growing steadily, incrementally, little by little, inch by inch. Amen. The Lord keeps sending people. If you're here Sunday night, you heard me mention a, a family came from Jessup, drove an hour and 20 minutes one way to church uh, just to check it out and to see what was going on here. So that's good stuff. Keep up the good work. Keep inviting. Uh, keep giving. Stay faithful. And uh, we're going we're gonna to see the Lord do great things, I believe. This revival is going to be kind of a catalyst to get us jump-started here into the fall and into what the Lord has for us here coming up. Well, in your Bibles, Revelation chapter number 3, and uh, we're looking at Sardis. And this church at Sardis has a pretty sad story, which we'll get to. And because we're now past the halfway point in these churches, I'm going to review just for a moment um, and come back and uh, share a little bit about, uh, for those who maybe have missed or they're watching online, I know some of our choir members uh, can't be here now, they're in choir and they'll come back and watch this, so just a little bit of a review before we get too far. But the seven churches, of course, are letters. These are seven letters, that's why the series is called You've Got Mail. Um, these are seven literal churches of Asia Minor that John was instructed in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation while he was in the Isle of Patmos uh, for the gospel ministry. He was being persecuted and being uh, ostracized and sent there as a punishment. And while he is there, Jesus shows up, amen, and uh, it shows you again, just like I talked about Sunday night, I didn't use him as an example, but about the trials, um, how that even in trials, I mean, think about this, he's in this great trial of suffering for the Lord, but guess what? The Lord was right there with him. And he was right where the Lord wanted him to be. And it was during that time in that uh, uh, Isle of Patmos that he was given this revelation. And those first couple chapters are to the churches. And they are literal churches from seven cities of Asia Minor in John's day. That's the primary, primary teaching. The prophetical teaching, which is what we have been emphasizing in this series is that these churches not only are literal churches, but they represent literal eras or ages of the church from its establishment by Christ in the New Testament until the rapture, which is indicated to us in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, where John hears a voice from heaven that says, come up hither. And that's an indication of the rapture and the church age ends, the age of grace ends, and uh, then the uh, the rest of Revelation begins. And so in these churches, each letter, Christ identifies himself to each church in a different manner. Uh, he uses different titles or calling cards, if you will. He tells every one of the churches, I know your works. I know your works, which is a great reminder that he knows uh, what's going on in every local New Testament church. He is aware, he's watching 
and he is keeping track. He also gives each of those churches instructions and he closes each letter with a spiritual call to give heed to what he has said. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So he opens the letters with an introduction. He reminds them of their works. He either commends or condemns them as the need calls for. And then he makes promises to them as overcomers, which we'll talk about in a minute for this church at Sardis. And then he closes that, that he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And so the introduction is always in the beginning. In that ancient time, they didn't close their letters with the signature. They opened their letters with the signature. So uh, kind of like uh, sometimes you'll still see, uh, you'll get something that'll say, from the desk of, and that person's name's at the top, right? Or you might get um, some type of an official uh, letter, and it would have the, the name of the company or the... Uh, person that's sending the letter before your address. And so it's all right there. It's a similar fashion. He addresses these letters. Um, as we look at these churches, we're coming up on number five. Ephesus, the first church, is the backslidden church. And remember, for our purposes, we're looking at the prophetical or the eras. Uh, we're looking at the eras and the errors, okay, <laughs> of the churches. But the era of Ephesus, we said, was that earliest church, that first church age. It ran to about... 170 AD. This is just a timeline. There's nothing set in stone. As a matter of fact, we see that the last four church ages kind of run congruently together. Uh, there are elements of all those churches still in uh, existence today, uh, starting with Thyatira last week to Sardis to Philadelphia and to Pergamos. Um, Catholic Church is still here, right? That's Thyatira. You're going to see the Reformed Church today. That's still here. The Philadelphia Church is here, and certainly the Laodicean Church is still here. So those last four run congruently. They're all together, but they have different focus. The spotlight is on a different one at different times uh, of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of the era. So Ephesus is the backslidden church. He tells them they left their first love, right? They didn't lose it. They left it. And he tells them to repent and do the first works again. And then Smyrna is the persecuted church, and that would run from about 170 uh, to 312 A.D., um, Great persecution, great suffering. This is the time of the emperors and the, the ten days he said that they were going to suffer. And this indicated ten different Roman rulers that were going to really put their thumb and just crush uh, this movement called Christianity. And we studied about that. That's the persecuted church. Christ did not condemn them in any way. He only showed compassion to that church. And he reminded them that he was the resurrection and the life. And that though they were, even if they were killed for his gospel's sake... They would live again, just as he did. And then there was the church at Pergamos, 312 to 600 A.D. This church was the worldly church, or the compromised church. This is where the church and state met together. And you saw uh, the people began to, uh, the leaders, the Caesars, the, the Roman rulers began to integrate the church into the government system. And so you had the church and state marriage in Pergamos, one of the definitions is to, to marry or to entwine. And so they became uh, the state church. And that led to uh, what we studied last week, Thyatira, from about 600 to 1500 A.D., uh, the dominance of the Catholic church. Thyatira is the tolerant church. And certainly this is where we saw um, the dark ages of, of human history. We saw uh, the great... Uh, misapplications of scripture. We saw the, the rise of the Pope, the papacy, and all of that we talked about last week. And that brings us to Sardis. And Sardis, as you see in your notes, is the dead church. <laughs> the dead church. And uh, prophetically, this era, uh, again, these are not hard, fast lines. These are just suggested time periods. But from about the early 1500s to about the mid 1700s, and you could go, you could skew that a little bit here or there, but this is when that church was in its dominance, okay? It's still around. A lot of dead churches around. Amen? A lot of dead churches around. But this is where that church came from, the, the, the Sardis era. And it's the dead church. And how do we know? Because Jesus told them. <laughs> You're dead. And it's one thing to be dead. 
It's another thing to be dead and not know your dead. We're going to see what happened here to the church at Sardis. And just as Thyatira represented the Catholic church age, represents, I guess, it's still going, Sardis represents Protestantism, the Reformation. What came out of the Catholic church? The Reformation and the rise of Protestantism. So let's look at this in our notes. Notice, first of all, though, the progression the church over the eras <laughs> went from backslidden to persecuted to worldly to tolerant to dead. Do you see the downward trajectory? That's where we find Sardis today. It's known as the dead church or the asleep church. Prophetically, it describes the period of the Reformation and the rise of Protestantism when people began to protest the teachings of the Catholic church and new denominations and groups were being formed. While there may have been great spiritual fervor in the early days, and there was, as they broke away from the Catholic Church, that soon gave way to religious traditions and ceremonies, including that they carried a lot of practices from the Catholic Church into their new movements. They also led to a sleepiness to the gospel and the mission of the church. As Jesus addresses Sardis, he mentions no persecution or heresy in this church. Everyone else, he's had to deal with some issue or he's had to warn them about something as far as uh, false teachers. Remember the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam and last week was Jezebel. Remember that? So this church he mentions, he doesn't say, hey, I understand you're being persecuted and hey, I understand you've got heresy. But it also is the first of the seven churches that he does not commend. There are no pats on the back for this church. There is no uh, keep up the good work and encouragement to this church. And the spiritual light had gone out of the church at Sardis. And it was filled with professors, but not possessors. They had a name, he says, that they were alive, but inside they were dead. Much like Jesus referred to the Pharisees as whited sepulchers. Beautiful on the outside, but filled with dead men's bones. So let's look at Revelation 3, 1. And under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Christ's main message to this church is to wake up. To wake up. This is the period of the Reformation, as I said, the rise of Protestantism. I don't have time to elaborate, but just so you understand very clearly, Baptists are not Protestants. You've got to understand that. Most Baptists don't know that. And it's because they don't know their history. And it's not taught. And so the world lumps everyone into you're either, if you're a Christian, they say, you're either Catholic or Protestant. Those are your only two choices. No. There's a third choice. Baptist. And I could do a whole, I probably will sometime, do a whole a message on why Baptists are not Protestants. You say, well, it's not a big deal. It's a very big deal. The Southern Baptist Convention is the largest, what the, the world calls, the media calls them, the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. And guess what? The Southern Baptists sit there and don't argue about that. They call themselves Protestants. But they're not Protestants. They're just not. I wish I had time to explain that to you. But maybe you'll see it a little bit here tonight, but we'll do a further study on why Baptists are not Protestants. 
The fact is, the Baptists were around for hundreds of years before there were any protests. Before Martin Luther ever nailed his thesis to the door and started what we call the Protestant Reformation, the Baptists, not known by the name of Baptist, but Anabaptists and other names, were around for centuries. And so we did not come out of the Protestant movement. We predate the Protestant movement, and we'll talk about that another time. So there's no commendation, as I said, from Christ. It's the first time in the seven churches that that happens. Even the other churches that have problems, he tells them, uh, but this thou hast, or, or this is good, or I, I, I'm glad about this, in so many words. And, and here he doesn't do that. It's the, only, the first church that there's no mention of commendation. It's also the first time there's no mention of the church being persecuted, because think about it. Persecution's coming from the pits of hell, and the devil has nothing to fear from dead churches. So there's no persecution going on in the church. This is the church that loves everybody, accepts everybody, goes with the flow. They're not going to be persecuted by the world because they're no threat to the world. They're not causing any problems. Nobody's getting saved in these churches. Nobody's getting baptized in these churches. No one's being discipled in these churches. So the devil has set them aside. They're neutralized for his consideration. He doesn't have to go after those churches. And so Jesus doesn't mention any persecution at Sardis. And as I said, while the Reformers came out of the Catholic Church, they kept many false doctrines and practices. And today, most of the Protestant denominations are built largely on works-based salvations. And the church has succumbed to dead orthodoxy, rituals, and formality. So let's look at the city of Sardis in your notes. It's approximately 30 miles south of Thyatira. And if you were to look at a map, you would see that there's a circuit, there's a, there is a a, a circle of these cities as you would go if you were traveling that's this is the route you would take and after you left Thyatira the next city on the road would be Sardis it uh, it was at the junction uh, of five roads it was a center of commercial five roads meaning major thoroughfares that day there weren't a lot of roads you understand it was a center of commercial trade and business they were known for their jewelry they were known for their wool. Um, located, the city was actually in two parts. There was a lower valley part where the commerce and the, uh, the, the travel was, was done. And then there was an upper level, about 800 feet high on the side of a mountain, was a fortress built. And uh, this fortress had a commanding view of the valley. They could see the enemy. They could see what was going on. It was a... Uh, kind of a two-part. I almost uh, kind of thought of like a Augusta and North Augusta, you know, that kind of a thing, all right? Or Minneapolis, St. Paul. It was, it was one city, but it was in two, two different spots. Uh, the valley below had the, had the, the commerce and the, the, the temples and all the different things, and then that fortress up above um, for their protection, as they thought. Um, it was thought to be impenetrable, but, sure enough, there are at least two times in its history where it was conquered. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it had been the capital of the province, or, uh, province of Lydia from the 500s B.C. and was once home to King Midas. You know, the muffler guy. No, not the muffler guy, but it is the legend of King Midas. He had the golden touch. Everything he touched turned to gold. And uh, it was one of the uh, it, financially, it was a it was like a uh, a New York City or a center of commerce. It was synonymous with wealth. Uh, it was one of the first cities to mint gold and silver coins. Militarily, it had a reputation of being unconquerable, though it did fall twice in 549 B.C. to the Persians, Cyrus and the Persians, and in 218 B.C. to the Greeks. In those battles. No care was given to the defense of the fortress above because they didn't think it could happen. So what happened is in the nighttime hours, uh, the 
enemy forces scaled those heights. And when they got over the wall, there was no defense there. And so with just a small group, they were able to take the fortress. And once they took the fortress, they had command of the, of the down, uh, lower part of the city. Y'all with me? So why did they have no defense there? Because they thought they were good, and they weren't. Kind of sounds like you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. So there's a lot of symbolism there with this church of Sardis or the city of Sardis. They thought they were self-confident. And so Christ introduces himself here at the church, uh, the church of Sardis. Notice the introduction. We're on Roman numeral 2. His introduction is found in verse 1. He is the, has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And that takes us back to Revelation uh, chapter 1. He refers to the seven uh, spirits, but he also talks about the stars. Look back at Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Write these things, he's right, telling John, which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. And so we believe those stars uh, reference the angels, he said, of the church, or the pastor of the church. And so he has the seven stars, but he also in his hand, but he also references the seven spirits of God. And this has caused some people confusion because they say, well, there's only one spirit of God, and that is true. But this is talking about here the manifestations of the spirit, and the phrasing has to do with complete wisdom. Seven is the number of what? Completion. And it's a, a, a reference of God's complete wisdom and the full manifestation of the Holy Spirit. There's a similar reference. If you keep your place there in Revelation, go back to Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, there's uh, some Bible scholars, and again, I'm not a Bible scholar. I never claim that. I'm a Bible student. But um, it's fascinating that in this reference here, Isaiah chapter 11, uh, the Spirit is referenced in seven, uh, with seven manifestations. And so many Bible scholars believe this is just a follow uh, following verse of that. So look at 11, uh, Isaiah 11, verse 2. He says, uh, the spirit of the Lord. Well, look at verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Okay? He's talking about the Lord there. Amen? Came from the, tr from the throne of David and the son of Jesse. And he says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him... So there's the Spirit of the Lord, and then the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. That's seven if you add those up. So some believe that's a reference back to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, the manifestations of the Spirit being wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord, all wrapped up in that seventh Holy Spirit. So don't, don't get sidetracked on that. That's just his title, and it has to do with full and complete manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So Christ is introducing himself in that manner. And then we see his condemnation. His condemnation. He said that you have, verse 1, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. This church was alive in name only. And this church didn't know that it was dead. That's what I'm saying. And when you consider a lot of the churches that fall into this Sardis definition, um, they don't know they're dead. They're busy, but they're dead. They have programs, but they're dead. So when you and I remember, and I've got to stop and not preach because I'm supposed to be teaching, right? Right? So I, when I say amen, just don't say nothing on Wednesday night. Now, on Sundays, you better respond. Oh, who said it? Don't say it now because I'll go into preaching, and I don't mean to go into preaching. What is the commission of the church? To go into all the world, 
Preach the gospel, right? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. So, soul winning, baptism, discipleship. That's the signs of a live church, a living church, fulfilling the Great Commission. So, if you have a church, and I use that phrase loosely, that doesn't preach the gospel, is it alive or is it dead? Yeah. If you have a church that doesn't care for the souls, I don't, listen, I'm not talking about care for the hungry, care for the poor, care for the homeless. I'm talking about cares for the souls of men. Preaching the gospel. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. If a church is not preaching the gospel, if a church is not actively seeking to win souls to Christ, not feed the hungry, put clothes on the naked, those are, those are good programs, those are good works. We are commanded to do those things, to care, to do unto others. But if they're not preaching the gospel and seeking the salvation of souls, are they alive or dead? Yeah. So... There's a lot of dead churches that don't know they're dead. They're busy. They have activity. They have programs. But they're dead. He said, you've got a name that you're living, but you're dead. It's kind of like an artificial plant. Do you know how real some plants look? They look so real. I've caught Paul Long watering fake plants before. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they look so real. They look so real. How about those mannequins in the store? You know, they got the clothes, they got the uh, hat, they got the purse on their shoulder, whatever. If you, you, they look real, but they're dead. There's nothing there, right? H how about you hunters? Any hunters out here? Okay. They got these decoys, okay? Ducks or geese or whatever. Some people put these plastic... Canada geese in their yard. I'm like, why would you do that? Because I would think it would attract more geese, wouldn't you? Don't want more of those geese. In my neighborhood, we don't want any more of those geese. But they look real. If you didn't know better, you'd think it was real. I, I, I've seen people with taxidermy things. I, I've got a deer head in my office from Ohio, the big buck, 12 point deer. And uh, I had a little kid one time come in and he saw that deer. And he went into the other room, and he's looking for the other half of the deer. He thought, he, he thought maybe, this was in Ohio, he thought maybe it had crashed through the wall and got stuck there. But I've seen full-mounted animals, foxes, coyotes, squirrels, bears. They look real. You with me? But they're dead. There's no life there. If you just looked at it, that's a church. But if you examined it closely, say it's dead. Dead. There's no heartbeat. There's no sign of life. There's no brain waves. It's dead. It's gone. And so this church was being deceiving. Kind of like when Jesus went to the fig tree, remember? The way the fig tree looked, he presumed there would be fruit there. It was putting forth blossoms. It was putting forth leaves. But there was no fruit. He said he found no figs thereon. And he cursed that tree. In much the same fashion, his condemnation of this church. You have a name that you're alive. You have a name that you're alive. But you're dead. When I was doing the, uh, when we were getting ready for the 9-11 service last, last year, last September, this year 9-11 actually falls on a Sunday, but we're not having the same kind of celebration because it was the 20th anniversary. That's kind of why we did it last time. But I, I personally went to uh, multiple fire stations and police departments handing out flyers and meeting people, inviting them to come. And There were a couple. One was on Pooler Parkway. I went there. And another one was over in Port Wentworth, and I forget where the third one was. That were, but there were at least three of them firehouses that I went to. The lights were on, the doors were open, 
and there's nobody there. They'd been called out on a fire or whatever, and they, you know, they, they're they gone. But, I mean, I just walked right in the building. I'm sure I was on somebody's camera, so I just kept waving wherever I was. So, so they knew I wasn't there, you know, and I had my badge and everything, so I was okay, and I just left a note and some flyers on the table, and I walked out. But they're public buildings, so I'm, and I'm the public, right? But I thought... I thought if I was having a medical emergency and couldn't make it to the hospital, and I said, there's a firehouse and paramedics, and I would drive there, but nobody was there, I might die. Right? Now, that's just a chance you take. It's not their fault. They're, they're out helping somebody else. But think about the spiritual application of that. If I'm drowning in sin, and I'm headed for hell... And I need hope. And I go to a church thinking that I'm going to get what I need. And they're dead. There's no gospel there. There's no preaching there. The stained glass windows aren't going to save me. The pipe organ's not going to help me. Hello? Hello? The membership program and classes are not going to help me. I need the gospel. And so I need a church that's a lie. So Jesus condemns this church. He said, you're being deceived, deceitful. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. And so let's go on. He says, I have not found thy works perfect before God. They were preaching, or professing Christ, but not possessing Christ. Hold that thought for a minute. They may have started out strong, but they were not making a difference now. He said, it reminded me of Paul's words when he said, they had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. They had a form of godliness. They were religious. They, they looked the part. They dressed the part. But they didn't, they didn't accept the power of the gospel. The church had gained man's approval but lost God's approval. They had ceased to be a witness and in effect stopped preaching the word of God. And isn't that today's Protestantism? Big cathedrals, stained glass windows, beautiful music, but no preaching on salvation. You won't even hear the word saved in most Protestant churches. You won't hear the word lost in most Protestant churches. You won't hear the word hell in most Protestant churches. You'll hear be kind, be tolerant. Be compassionate. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. This describes, I often wondered when I was younger, what in the world? How are these people? I didn't connect the dots. But look at Matthew chapter 7 in verse 21. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful what? Works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is the dead church. They have all the trappings of Christianity. They have all the wrappings of Christianity. My daughter has pulled this on me several times. I don't know why I keep falling for it. But she'll take a piece of Wrigley's gum. And she'll put that Wrigley's gum in her mouth. And then she'll put that wrapper of that Wrigley's gum right back in the little sleeve. And will say to me, do you want a piece of gum? And I take it from her. And I said, it's, yes, I wanted a piece of gum. She said, so did I. <laughs> but she gave me a wrapper that looked like Wrigley's gum, was labeled Wrigley's gum, was folded like Wrigley's gum, was the exact size of Wrigley's gum, but there was nothing there. 
Nothing there. They were full of good works, but there's no preaching on salvation, no calls to repentance, no calls to get right with God. They wouldn't understand what the word revival meant if you gave them a dictionary. When's the last time you've heard of a Protestant church hosting revival? I guess it could happen. I don't know that I've ever seen it. I've been in ministry not as long as Pastor Hubbard, but a good while. I never remember seeing revival at the Methodist Church. Revival services at the Presbyterian Church. Oh, there was a day. There was a day. We're going to see that in a minute. There was a day when the Methodists preached the Bible and the Presbyterians preached the Bible and the Congregationalists preached the Bible. There was a day, but they're dead now. They're dead. Maintaining programs, but not making disciples. Full of good works, but missing the gospel message. He said, I have found, not found thy works perfect before God. And then Christ's instructions, he says, wake up. Wake up, verse 2, chapter 3. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Uh, verse 4, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And this to me is indicative of them just losing their, losing their position. Um, they're, they're, I know it sounds very harsh, but I didn't write the book. Okay? Uh, they're useless. When, for the gospel's sake. They do good works. They, they help people with needs. But for the gospel's sake. Okay. I had an old man in Ohio used to say, use this phrase. He said, you're as useless. Uh, he told, <laughs> told his cousin. I heard him say it. and I, had to, I said, say that one more time. <laughs> he said to his cousin, they were fighting about something. They were old, two grumpy old men. Did you ever notice that movie was called Grumpy Old Men? It wasn't called Grumpy Teenagers, right? Grumpy Old Men. But he said to his cousin, he said, you're as useless as a pocket on underwear. <laughs> That's funny right there. I don't care who you are. That's funny right there. And spiritually speaking, without being unkind to the individuals, I'm talking about the church of Sardis. He said, I, I'm going to come upon you. And basically, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm done with you. You're dead. You realize there's only so much you can do with a dead person. And there's only so much he could do with a dead church. And so, wake up, remember, repent. Now he says, strengthen the things which remain. And this to me is indicative of those flashes of good, the, the early days of Protestantism, the early days of the Reformation. Uh, again, uh, s some of the preachers that we quote, some of the great preachers and pulpiteers of the 17, 1800s, they were not uh, a Baptist. They preached the gospel. The Whitfields and and uh, all of those different ones, uh, Jonathan Edwards and even the Wesleys and the early days of Methodism and some of those things were powerful. And so he says, uh, strengthen those things, strengthen those things which remain. And then he says, remember, I think he's taking them back to their early days. Remember that zeal, that fervor that you had and repent. Why would you repent? Why, why would he call them to repent? Because if they would remember those things, what did the prodigal son do? He started remembering home, didn't he? And he said, how many of my father's servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? And once he remembered what he had lost, he repented. It's similar to what he says to Ephesus. Remember the first works and repent, be zealous therefore. So he's calling them to revival. He's giving them a window of opportunity, a window of revival. But history records what? They didn't take it. 
They didn't take it. They became mainline, what the media calls mainline denominations. And this is why, listen, this is why people can attend a church that says abortion is okay. This is why people can attend a church with a transgendered pastor. This is why people can attend a church that blesses same-sex marriages. Because it's a dead church. It does not have the breath of Christ. It does not have the life of the Lamb of God. And it's a sad state of affairs. It's a sad state of affairs. So the church at Sardis, he instructs them, remember, repent. If you don't, if you don't, he says, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. What does a thief do? Besides working for the government. About 87,000 more IRS agents coming your way. 87,000. No, they, they take away things. So when Jesus talks about the rapture being as a thief in the night, what's he talking about? He's going to take away his bride. He's going to snatch her away. We're going up, amen? Here he's talking to the church, I'm going to come on you as a thief. I'm going to take that light. I'm going to take that candle. I'm going to take that influence. I'm going to take that ministry because you're not using it. You're not doing what I called you to do, so... I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. And so he says, uh, wake up, remember, repent, and uh, believe the gospel, live the gospel, share the gospel. By the way, that's coming out in a message soon. But when you hear it, act like you've never heard it before. Okay. He's, He's warning them, if you don't repent, you're going to be judged. If you don't repent, you're going to be judged. They didn't do it. And so where are they today? They're stagnant. They're irrelevant. And and I, I know this sounds very harsh. Don't send me hate mail if you're watching online. But when it comes to people being saved, the gospel way, the Bible way of being saved, these churches are making no impact. You follow me? There's no all. First of all, there's no preaching of the Word of God because they've long ago put away the Word of God. So there's no preaching. So if you're not preaching, there's going to be no conviction. If there's no conviction, you don't need an altar, right? So these churches have no altar calls. They have no revivals. They have no door-to-door soul winning they have so what i'm saying is for the I'm trying to say this as nice as i can as the gospel is concerned they're really irrelevant they may be making an impact in the personal needs of people soup kitchens shelters those types of things But for the gospel's sake, they're not doing anything. They don't plant new churches to preach the gospel. Matter of fact, most of those Protestant churches are shrinking. They're in decline. They're in disarray. A lot of them are in lawsuits because the denomination wants the building and the people thought they owned the building, but the denomination said, no, we own the building. And so you're going to teach this that we want you to teach or you're going to have to leave the premises. So they're splitting and splintering all across the world. And I'm, I'm speaking with a broad brush. I'm sure you could find certain places and certain churches that so I'm sure you could. But I'm talking about as the era, the Sardis era. Y'all with me? Okay. I know I'm painting with a big broad brush, but as far as the era of the Sardis church, it's, it's, it's done. Put a fork in it. 
It's done. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to come upon you. And so then you look at Christ's promises. And again, just as we said with Thyatira last week, there is always a remnant. There are people saved in these churches. Look at verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He's talking about the truly saved. And just as I mentioned, you don't have to be a Baptist to be saved. Amen? Amen. You don't have to be a Baptist to be saved. And there are, from earlier days, from earlier days, there were people saved in these churches. And uh, like I said, you may find a percentage. I would dare say, I, I will give you there's a percentage, but I would dare say it's probably less than 10%. Billy Graham estimated that less than, less than 20% of church members in these churches were actually saved. He said 80% were probably not really saved. Because they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. They had religion, but no relationship. And so there is a remnant, he said, those that have not soiled their garments. And he talked about that. And then he talks about the overcomers. Look at verse 5. He that overcometh. Who are the overcomers, church? We talked about this now five weeks in a row. Save people. Saved people. Those who are in Christ, because Christ said, I have overcome the world. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And by grace are you saved through faith. And so every time you see the overcomers, it's talking about you and me. Talking about the saved of that era, the saved of that church. They're the overcomers. And he always gives promises at the end of each letter. He says, first of all, they're going to be clothed in white raiment white raiment uh, and the bride wore white amen this is a picture of the righteousness of christ it's a picture of being cleansed from our sins and um, notice with me uh revelation 19 you're in chapter 3 go to revelation 19 we're almost done and look at verse 11 john sees this sight he says i saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, verse 12, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. You're going to see that next week in Philadelphia. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen. What was the linen, church? White and clean. This is a symbol of the bride. This is a symbol of the wife of Christ. The wife of, uh, been, she's been married now by that chapter. His wife has made herself ready. So you're going to be clothed in white raiment, verse 5 says. And he says this, And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. Boy, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of, of back and forth about this and the book of life and the Lamb's book of life and which is, is it the same book and which is which? And some have said, oh, right there is a sign that you can lose your salvation. And the answer is no. That is not a sign you can lose your salvation. That is actually a sign the opposite direction. That's a promise of eternal security. If you're an overcomer, your name's never leaving the book of life. And that's who he's talking to, to him that overcometh. If you're saved, you're saved. And this is also symbolic of that city of Sardis being a wealthy city and a, a capital city would have a book of citizenship. And so they would quickly recognize this example because when you were dead, they would take your name out of the book. It was the census, basically. If you were a criminal, they would take your name out of the book. And so he's speaking literally and figuratively here. He's explaining to them, even though they're dead, the church is dead, if you're an overcomer, your name's still in the book. And so there's some symbolism of the registry, but it's also a confirmation of eternal security. If you're saved, you're in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And uh, then he said, I will confess his name before the Father and his angels, and for time's sake, in Luke chapter 12, 
Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. And so here's the confession. Confession. For with the heart man believeth unto the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto what? Anybody know? Salvation. So those who confess are those who are saved. With the heart, Romans 10, 9 and 10. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made of salvation. And on this point about eternal security, I found a neat quote from Charles Stanley. He's a Baptist, by the way. Charles Stanley said this. Y'all heard of Charles Stanley? Okay. He's a Georgia boy, or at least for many, many years. I don't know where he was born at. Virginia, I think. But he said this. Does it make any sense to say that salvation is offered as a solution for our sin but that our salvation can be lost because of our sin. It's <laughs> a good point, isn't it? Does it make any sense to say that salvation is offered as a solution for our sin, but then to say salvation can be taken away because of our sin? Mm -mm. Doesn't make sense. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And so the promise to the overcomer, well, I've skipped a lot. You may not believe me, but I did because of time's sake. But the church at Sardis is, is here, and we see it, and we deal with it. It's known as Protestantism, and again, by and large, by and large, it's dead. And he said, you've got a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Now, next week is the church at Philadelphia, and this is the church that churches like ours um, identify as. And so, as I said, Thyatira, the Catholic Church, Sardis, the Protestant Church, Philadelphia, the Faithful Church, and Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Those are all in operation today. But we'll see the differences, and we'll see what identifies us as a Philadelphia church and the promises to that church and the commendation to that church. So we'll do that next week. Amen? All right, let's bow in prayer. Thank you for being with us tonight. Father, we're grateful to see from your word the importance of life in the church. And that life comes from your Holy Spirit. And where that Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But where there is no vision, the people perish. And so, Lord, I pray that as we would study these churches and we would understand uh, the whys, we, we look and, and see all the different churches and all the denominations. And, uh, Lord, we're many times lumped together as Christians, but your word teaches us that there's very distinct and discernible differences in these types of churches. And so, Lord, may we learn those and grow from that, and may we be dedicated and determined uh, as a Philadelphia-era church uh, to, Lord, serve and to reach our world with the gospel to the very best of our ability. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me just say this as a, as a teaser for next week. Um, when something's dead, it has to be revived, right? And so the Philadelphia church is the era of revival and you'll see that coming out of the protestant reformation and you'll you'll have a good time with the lesson next week